uh, we're now on the record, I apologize. We're now on the record, today's date is September 1st, 2021. The time is now 9.03 a.m. My name is Ethan Watson, city clerk for the city of Albuquerque. We are holding this hearing in the Vincent E. Griego Council Chambers. Um, I'm going to go around the room starting at my right to ask that you introduce yourselves for the record. Please speak clearly and indicate both your name and title. Uh, this is Kevin Morrow, Acting Deputy City Attorney. Alan Hines, Assistant City Attorney. Daniel Gallegos from the law firm of Harrison and Hart on behalf of myself, Manny Gonzalez, who sits to my right. Um, and with us today is also our hearing monitor, Jessica Enriquez, uh, who is with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, Sheriff Gonzalez, did you want to introduce yourself, or, I, or did you take the council's introduction? Sorry, I didn't want to <laughs> cut you off. Okay. Um, so I am conducting this hearing to, in accordance with Judge Bishide's ruling and in the performance of my duty to determine whether candidates have met the requirements to be certified for public financing under Section 7 of the Open and Ethical Election Code and the Open and Ethical Election Code regulations. Uh, this, these, this code and these regulations will be referred most likely throughout this hearing today as the OEEC and the OEEC regulations. Um, for the purpose of this hearing, you will be free to present any evidence that you believe bears on the matters described um, subsequently and that you believe would show that you met all the requirements to be qualified for public financing. During today's hearing, uh, to provide you notice, Deputy City Attorney Kevin Morrow will read, an, read the applicable law and charges into the record in sections and then I will give you an opportunity to respond to each section. We need to cover all sections in the allotted time. I will note um, that there appear to be few attendees today, but I would ask that this um, hearing be well ordered. Um, there will be no signs and there will also be no public comment. Um, we anticipate this hearing will conclude at noon today. I will now ask Mr. Morrow to begin um, his reading. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Uh, two issues run through the matters detailed below and will be significant to the certification decision. First, under Part C6 of the Open and Ethical. I'll move it a little closer. Is that better? Okay. Uh, first, under Part C6 of the Open and Ethical Elections Code regulations. Qualifying contributions will be deemed fraudulent if the funds for the required contribution are provided by any person other than the contributor who is listed on the receipt. The Board of Ethics found that Mr. Gonzalez personally violated that requirement in relation to Dean Zantow's qualifying contribution receipt and fined him accordingly. To the extent that Mr. Gonzalez, you claim you did not know and should not have known of this violation, despite your personal participation, whether you knew or should have known that you violated that you participated in this conduct will therefore bear directly on the question of certification. Second, under Part C15 of the OEEC regulations, the clerk shall not certify an applicant candidate where that candidate has been found to either have, one, made a materially false statement in a report or other documents submitted to the city clerk, or two, submitted any fraudulent qualifying contribution or any falsified acknowledgement forms for qualifying contributions or seed money contributions, where the applicant knew or should have known of the fraudulence or falsification. Under these standards, the presence of qualifying contributions and the paperwork associated with those contributions that are fraudulent and about which you knew or should have known preclude certification. Please be prepared to address the extent to which you either deny that any fraudulent qualifying contribution documents were submitted or deny that you knew or should have known of the fraud including the role of your designated campaign representative. Additionally, for the record, it should be noted that the Board of Ethics held a hearing on Board of Ethics Complaint 1-2021. The parties presented evidence and live testimony at the hearing, which the board considered and weighed. The board found that Sheriff Gonzalez violated the OEEC and related regulations and issued a fine of $500. Um, can I just ask that counsel for um, Mr. Gonzalez's campaign approach, I have a copy of the 
if I can give you for the record. And so, um, uh, Mr. Gallegos, I'm going to show you this document. It's dated August 30th, 2021, and I'd ask that um, you and your client confirm that is the notice of contemplated action that I sent you uh, and, and through counsel and um, that you received it and the, re the related attachments. This does appear to be the notice of contemplated action that was sent on August 30th along with, uh, I believe, over 500 pages of exhibits. Thank you. Um, Sheriff Gonzalez, the purpose of this hearing today is to give you an opportunity to respond either orally in writing to the charges in the notice of contemplated action. The purpose of the today's hearing is not necessarily to finally resolve the propriety of the proposed denial of certification. It is, initial, it is an initial check against a mistaken decision, essentially a determination of whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that the allegations in the notice are true and support a denial of certification for public financing under the Open and Ethical Elections Code and its attendant regulations. During today's hearing, um, as I noted, Mr. Morrow will read the first section and give you a part time to respond to that section. We will then move on to the second, third, and fourth sections of the open of the notice of contemplated action. Um, Mr. Morrow, if you would now read the first section related to the initiation of the public finance period. Certainly, Mr. Clerk. Uh, on April 9th, 2021, you filed a declaration of intent to seek public financing with the Office of the City Clerk, indicating you intended to seek public financing for your campaign for the Office of Mayor. Please see Exhibit 1, the Declaration of Intent. In that declaration, you swore and affirmed that you would comply with the open and ethical election code contribution and expenditure limitations and all other requirements set forth in the OEEC. You further agreed to comply with the regulations of the Albuquerque City Clerk for the Open and Ethical Elections Code. You submitted two additional forms to the City Clerk's office that day. The first was an acknowledgement of familiarity with codes and required disclosures in which you acknowledge that you are familiar with the City Charter's election code, rules and regulations of the Board of Ethics and campaign practices related to the election code of the City Charter, and the 2021 regulations of the Albuquerque City Clerk. Please see Exhibit 2. The second form was a designation of representatives in which you designated three individuals as representatives for your campaign for the purpose of submitting materials to or p picking materials up from the city clerk's office regarding your candidacy. Uh, please see Exhibit 3, the designation of representatives. In that form, you designated three individuals as representatives for your campaign. Dolores Gonzalez Limon, Megan McMillan, and Michelle Martinez. And you agreed in that form that you were fully responsible for the statements made and materials submitted by these representatives on behalf of your campaign. In testimony before the city hearing officer on July 15th, 2021, you and other witnesses called on your behalf, further acknowledged that Ms. McMillan and Ms. Martinez were members of the quote, core group of your campaign. Your campaign finance filings show that Ms. McMillan was paid $11,418.75 and appears to have been your campaign's only paid staff person during the qualifying period for public financing. Please see Exhibit 4. Um, Council, those are the first part of the allegations against uh, your client and the first part of the legal basis for the proposed denial. Um, how do you respond to them? Your response will be part of the record. At this time, what, what, what I think I'll, I'll do is I have... Uh, kind of a long statement that includes a couple of objections that I'd like to make at this point. And then what I can do is, uh, in my response to the follow-on sections, I will give a truncated uh, version of, of our response. But uh, if, if you will indulge me uh, as, we, as we approach this first uh, opportunity to speak, I, I would request the option or request the opportunity uh, to make a statement. Um, you can use your time as you choose. Um, Mr. Gallegos, what I will say is that we do need to cover all four sections of the notice during the time allotted. Understood. Uh, 
All right, and let me know if you can hear me all right. Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, one of the court's staunchest procedural due process defenders, once said, procedural fairness, if not all that originally was meant by due process of law, is at least what it most uncompromisingly requires. Procedural due process is more elemental and less, fle less flexible than substantive due process. It yields less to the times, varies less with conditions, and defers much less to legislative judgment. Insofar as it is technical law, it must be specialized responsibility within the competence of the judiciary, on which they do not bend before political branches of the government, as they should on matters of policy, which, comp which comprise substantive law. If it be conceded that in some way the agency can take the action that it did, does it matter what the procedure is? Only the untaught layman or the charlatan lawyer can answer that procedure matters not. Procedural fairness and regularity are of the indispensable essence of liberty. Severe substantive laws can be endured if they are fairly and impartially applied. Indeed, if put to the choice, one might well prefer to live under Soviet substantive law applied in good faith by our common law procedures than under our substantive law enforced by Soviet procedural practices. Procedural due process, this most elemental and indispensable essence of liberty, has already been denied once to Sheriff Gonzalez by the city clerk. Judge Brian Beadscheid, having found the due process violation, sent the case back to the city clerk, giving him discretion in fashioning a hearing which will provide due process protections, but giving the clerk one crucial, non-negotiable instruction. Due process must be afforded to Gonzalez. The notice of hearing provided to Sheriff Gonzalez just minutes before 5 p.m. on Monday provided little detail regarding the actual hearing and two big questions were left unanswered. Who is the decision maker and what is the burden of proof and who bears the burden of proof? We posed those questions to the clerk's attorneys and we heard back yesterday morning at 10 a.m., less than 24 hours before the scheduled hearing. Having reviewed the answers given by the clerk's attorneys to our campaign's questions regarding today's hearing, it appears that the clerk again intends to deny Sheriff Gonzalez a fair hearing and procedural due process. Specifically, it is our understanding, and it is our understanding uh, sitting here now, that the city clerk himself will be the decision maker. It is also our understanding, and it's our understanding from what we've heard so far, that the clerk considers this hearing to be a louder mill type predetermination hearing, meaning that this is not a formal evidentiary hearing. It is an initial check against mistaken decisions, essentially a determination of whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that the charges against Mr. Gonzalez are true and support the proposed action, i.e. denial of certification. In other words, the hearing this morning will be conducted by an objectively and subjectively biased decision maker using basically the lowest possible standard an initial check against mistaken decision based on whether there are reasonable grounds to deny certification. It is clear that this hearing falls well short of procedural due process and procedural fairness, and we object to this hearing on due process grounds. On July 6th, the attorney for the Keep Keller campaign sent an ex parte letter along with 100 previously undisclosed exhibits directly to the city clerk requesting that he deny the Gonzalez campaign certification for public financing without any notice to the Gonzalez campaign that he was considering the contents of the letter, the previously undisclosed exhibits, and two other complaints filed by the Cam Keller campaign, the city clerk denied certification to the Gonzalez campaign. This denial was unprecedented. This denial was also unconstitutional. And last Friday afternoon, District Judge Brian Beadscheid found that the city clerk himself denied Sheriff Gonzalez his procedural due process rights. And he sent this case back to the clerk with three options. Summarily deny certification if a finding has already been made in a hearing affording due process to Sheriff Gonzalez that would justify denial. Two, summarily grant certification if there has been no such finding. 
or three, set forth a process by which Sheriff Gonzalez would be afforded due process. The clerk, just before the deadline of 5 p.m. on Monday, chose option three. According to Judge Beachside, due process must be afforded to Sheriff Gonzalez. Due process requires notice, a meaningful opportunity to be heard, and an impartial decision maker. Or as it's stated in Goldberg versus Kelly, and of course, an impartial decision maker is essential. That's 397 U.S. 254 at 271. Our own cases here in New, Mexico, in New Mexico echo the importance of a fair and impartial decision maker. In Reed versus New Mexico Board of Examiners of Optometry, 1979 NMSC 005, our Supreme Court recognized that at a minimum, a fair and impartial tribunal requires that the trier of fact be disinterested and free from any form of bias or predisposition regarding the outcome of the case, and that the inquiry is not whether the trier of fact is actually biased or prejudiced, but whether in the natural course of events there is an indication of a possible temptation to an average man sitting as a judge to try the case with bias for or against any issue presented to him. In City of Albuquerque versus Chavez, 1997 NMCA 054, our Court of Appeals applied an objective appearance of fairness test and held that in order to guarantee a fair hearing where a reasonable person would have serious doubts about whether the hearing officer could be fair, it is inappropriate for the hearing officer to hear the case. The city clerk, Ethan Watson, is far from a fair, neutral, or impartial decision maker in this case. He has a stake in the outcome of this case. He was appointed by and is answerable to the incumbent mayor, Tim Keller, Sheriff Gonzalez's opponent. And the clerk's term in office coincides and terminates with the term of Mayor Keller. Bottom line, if Mayor Keller loses this election, the city clerk is out of a job. The city clerk is also a defendant in a lawsuit filed by Sheriff Gonzalez and a number of voters. And in court pleadings, the city clerk has accused Sheriff Gonzalez of baselessly impugning his ability to perform the functions of city clerk, as well as going after him personally. In terms of institutional bias, a decision maker who makes a decision prior to a hearing is less likely to reverse himself. And where there are facts in dispute, the clerk has already shown that he has a predisposition against our version of the facts, which renders this hearing meaningless. And this is especially true where we have a decision maker who made factual determinations, made a decision, and then defended that decision in an adversarial process, both at the hearing officer stage and then again on appeal, directly adversary to my client. In his response uh, in the appeal, he detailed the factual determinations he contends prove fraud. In the closing argument made before the hearing officer in writing, pages five through eight detail the factual determinations made by the clerk in support of his denial decision. And in fact, during the appeal, the clerk even accused Sheriff Gonzalez of burying his head in the sand like an ostrich. It also appears that the clerk is acting as an investigator in this case. Specifically, in this 500 pages of exhibits that were provided to Sheriff Gonzalez at 5 p.m. on Monday, there appears an exhibit, Exhibit 10, that is made up entirely of investigator general documents that had not, to that point, been disclosed in any other pleading and which were not included in the Inspector General's report. This strongly suggests that the clerk sought out information to strengthen the case against Sheriff Gonzalez. These are not the actions of a neutral and impartial decision maker. They are the actions of an adversarial party trying to win. Now, the only way that a biased decision maker does not matter at this stage is if this hearing is essentially meaningless. But it can't be that the district court sent this case back so that the city clerk can conduct a meaningless hearing. 
when the essence of due process is a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Otherwise, a meaningless hearing only serves to prolong the limbo that the Gonzalez campaign has been in since July 9th, when the clerk first deprived Sheriff Gonzalez of due process. I cannot conceive of any reason why the court would send back this case for a due process hearing before a biased decision maker. The court already decided that the post deprivation hearing is not sufficient to cure a due process violation in the first instance, that is at the pre deprivation stage, which strongly indicates then that the pre deprivation stage where we are right now must be a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Thus, when Judge Beach had ordered that due process must be afforded to Sheriff Gonzalez, that due process would have to, it would have to include a neutral and impartial decision maker. The risk of bias here is too great to tolerate. The opportunity to be heard by a biased decision maker falls well short of the promise of the due process clause. And basically what we have is a sham, a meaningless hearing that displays only the thinnest veneer of due process. This hearing is, in a word, a farce. Now, a biased decision maker is not the only problem with this morning's hearing. The clerk calls this a Loudermill hearing. Now, Loudermill dealt with termination of public employment. And despite the clerk's reimagining of the pre-termination versus post-termination hearings in the public employment context, the context in which we are dealing cannot simply be rephrased as predetermination and post-determination. Because like all due process cases, they are looked at in terms of the competing interests. And the competing interests here are nothing like those in the public employment context. Now in Goldberg versus Kelly, 397 U.S. 254, our, the U.S. Supreme Court stated, in almost every setting where important decisions turn on question of fact, Due process requires an opportunity to confront and cross-examine adverse witnesses. That is what we should be getting this morning, but we are not. Instead, we have 500 pages of documentary evidence, untested, unconfronted. Now, not surprisingly, the least amount of process possible, the easiest pathway to denial has been created by the clerk who is not an impartial decision maker. Basically, we're looking at the lowest standard of proof, reasonable grounds, and the broadest amount of evidence, 500 pages, plus, according to the email I received from the clerk's attorneys, settled against a backdrop of everything that has happened so far. So it's not just this pile of paper in front of me, but apparently the clerk is planning on looking at every single thing that has happened in this case. Now, due process requires that a decision be made based off of the evidence in the record. I am not positive at this point that everything that the backdrop is set against is part of that record. Now, the clerk has already made factual determinations in this case, and he has argued in support of those, both in front of the city hearing officer and in front of Judge Beadshide. So to the extent that louder mill standards apply, we still have the problem of a biased decision maker unlikely to reverse his dug in legal and factual positions. Now the city clerk could have given us a fair hearing, although I don't know why we thought he would, but we did. We waited on, on bated breath uh, for the process to come out uh, anticipating that perhaps uh, we would be given procedural due process this time around. I've been around boxing. I've been a boxing fan my entire life. How could I not be? Albuquerque is the city of boxing champions. And the people of this city know a fixed fight when they see one. And there is not one person in Albuquerque right now who believes that this is going to be a fair hearing. Now, for some, that's reason for consternation. For others, including and especially the Keep Keller campaign, 
That is the reason for giddy confidence and optimism. And if you don't believe me, take a look at the post on the Keith Keller Facebook page from last Friday, right before the district court hearing where the campaign was careful to point out to Keller's supporters that if the judge rules that the city clerk should not have de denied Gonzalez certification, the clerk has other options, legal and administrative, before any public financing money is dispersed. In other words, folks in this community believe the fix is in. Whether you're happy about that or not simply depends on who you support. And the thinnest veneer of due process does not change any of that. We also object to this hearing on jurisdictional grounds. The clerk has basically reopened the certification decision to consider a broad swath of information that was not before him at the time of his deadline to certify or deny. Now, if this is proper, we demand equal treatment. We demand that the city clerk reopen his decision to certify the Keller campaign for public financing and that he consider the allegations that have come to light regarding the Keller campaign's collection of qualifying contributions, which have been made in a complaint and which can be seen in various Albuquerque Journal articles and which bear striking resemblance to the allegations made against Sheriff Gonzalez. Now, some folks would call that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Some folks would call it equal protection under the law. In any case, if the clerk does not see the certification decision as taking place at a fixed point in time, but rather sees certification as some sort of ongoing process, subject to consideration of new facts and evidence months after the fact, he needs to treat the Keller campaign the same way as he has treated the Gonzalez campaign. At the very least, he should order the city inspector general to investigate the Keller campaign practices. The Keep Keller campaign should have the same microscopes trained on every single piece of paper and every single action of every single campaign volunteer. And if they come out with zero defects, with zero issues, then good on them. But given the allegations that have come to light, I would be willing to bet that we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Equal treatment is all we're asking for. But the fact that the clerk has a stake in the upcoming election and the election of Mayor Tim Keller, I wouldn't hold my breath. Now, in terms of the merits, without waiving the due process or jurisdictional argument, and at the risk of legitimizing uh, this meaningless hearing, I will say that Sheriff Gonzalez and his campaign turned in 4,182 clerk-verified qualifying contributions, 403 more than the amount required. Now, there are a number of allegations, and I will wait to address as, as, as two of these uh, come up. But, and I, I've broken them down essentially as the Zantal allegation and the rest of the allegations. And I'll address those as they uh, come. Uh, and and I, will, I will make those points to preserve them, not because we believe that the clerk will be persuaded. And that is to the extent that the clerk himself has personally and vigorously argued against Sheriff Gonzalez on these points, we think it incredibly unlikely that the clerk will reverse himself at this stage. While stranger things have happened, <clears throat> it's abundantly clear that this hearing was designed to pay lip service to Judge Beachide's ruling and to the Constitution. Now, who suffers from such a deprivation of due process? Clearly, the Gonzalez campaign and Sheriff Manny Gonzalez, which has been in limbo for nearly two months, unable to run a competitive campaign, dividing its attention between the campaign trail and legal proceeding after legal proceeding after legal proceeding, all to come full circle for a sham hearing before the same biased decision maker. Democracy suffers as well. Thousands of regular folks here in Albuquerque contributed $5 to the Gonzalez campaign so that Sheriff Gonzalez could receive public financing, either because they believe in the sheriff and what he can do as mayor, or because they believe in the process and want to see people have the opportunity to run competitive campaigns. This is a monumental election in our city. Crime and homelessness are out of control. Our voters deserve a robust campaign between the incumbent 
and those who have stepped up to offer new ideas and new visions for our city. Going back to Justice Jackson, recall that he said, one might well prefer to live under Soviet substantive law applied in good faith by our common law procedures than under our substantive law enforced by Soviet procedural practices. For one self-interested bureaucrat to have the power to basically decide an election in his boss's favor and to disenfranchise thousands of voters is downright un-American. It doesn't have to be this way, Mr. City Clerk. You can do the right thing. You can do the stand-up thing. You can let the voters decide this election. You can certify Sheriff Gonzalez, allow him to campaign on a competitive and equal footing, and let the chips fall where they may. Thank you. We'll now turn to the second part of the charges and allegations identified in the notice of contemplated action. Uh, Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Watson. The qualifying period during which you could gather qualifying contributions began on April 19th, 2021. Over the course of the qualifying period, your campaign, specifically Megan McMillan and Michelle Martinez, turned in paper qualifying contributions to the city clerk's office on the specific dates and the amounts outlined in Exhibit 5 of the Notice of Contemplated Action. The Office of the City Clerk obtained information calling into question whether you and your campaign met the requirements to be certified for public finance on, on June 7th, 2021. On that day, a complaint was filed against your campaign with the city's Board of Ethics. See Board of Ethics 1-2021, Olguin versus Gonzalez. The complaint included a signed statement from Mr. Dean Zantow. Mr. Zantow explains in a statement that during a Salvation Army Advisory Board meeting that you attended on May 27, 2021, you sought and accepted a receipt for a qualifying contribution from Mr. Zantow, but told him you would cover the $5 contribution. The qualifying contribution receipt for Mr. Zantow has your signature as the person who collected it, and you submitted that receipt in your application for public financing. Mr. Zantow's statement and the complaint led to an independent investigation by the Office of the Inspector General. That Office of Inspector General investigation found that you collected qualifying contribution receipts without the required $5 contributions from at least two additional people during the same Salvation Army Advisory Board meeting. When Michelle Martinez turned the qualifying contribution forms for Mr. Zantow and others, she did so with the correct amount of money to suggest that each had provided you with the required contribution. And Mr. Gallegos, those are the second part of the allegations against uh, the Gonzalez campaign, the second part of the legal basis for the proposed denial identified in the notice of contemplated action. Um, how do you respond to those? Your response will be part of the record. Um, at the risk of giving any credence to this meaningless hearing and legitimizing this hearing, uh, we will um, admit uh, things that are that are essentially factual in terms of things that were turned in. Um, and Mr. Gregos, I would ask that you speak into the mic. I apologize. No. We will we will admit to anything that's that's factual in in that statement, including uh, I think some of these numbers and the and the chart, to the extent that. Uh, there are allegations uh, being made uh, by outside uh, folks. Uh, we, we deny all of the allegations. We deny uh, that Sheriff Gonzalez knew or should have known uh, that uh, anything was fraudulent. We'll now turn We'll now turn to the third part of the allegations and charges identified in the Notice of Contemplated Action. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Uh, the third allegation is that the qualifying period ended on June 19th, 2021. On that date, uh, Mr. Gonzalez submitted his application for certification as a participating candidate for the office of mayor. Uh, there, Sheriff Gonzalez again swore that he complied with the OEEC and complied with all requirements to in gathering the materials you provided in an effort to receive public financing. On June 29, 2021, a second complaint was filed with the Board of Ethics. Please see complaint 
Board of Ethics 02-2021, also known as Old Gein 2. Attached to that complaint were more than 20 qualifying contributions showing mismatches between the voters' purported signatures on duplicate qualifying contributions, between the voters' signature on a qualifying contribution and a petition, and between the voters' signature on a qualifying contribution and their voter registration card. On July 6, 2021, a letter was submitted to the Office of the City Clerk with additional qualifying contributions with similar problems with purported voter signatures on qualifying contribution receipts. And those are the third part of the allegations against the Gonzales, uh, Sheriff Gonzalez and the Gonzalez campaign and the third part of the legal basis for the proposed denial outlined in the notice of contemplated action. Um, how do you respond to that portion of the notice? Your response will be part of the record. All right, at the risk of giving any credence to this meaningless hearing or legitimizing this hearing, we will admit to uh, factual statements, including the uh, submission of, of paperwork by Sheriff Gonzalez. We deny all of the other allegations in terms of those. Uh, they are based upon untested, unconfronted un hearsay. And we have argued uh, that the sheriff did not know, nor should he have known, of the fraudulent nature of any of those alleged fraudulent qualifying contributions. <clears throat> we'll now turn to the fourth um, section of the Notice of Contemplated Action. Um, Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Watson. The fourth portion of this is as follows. The Office of the City Clerk found that Sheriff Gonzalez did not qualify for public financing on July 9th, 2021. As detailed in the clerk's letter to Mr. Gonzalez and his campaign on July 9th, 2021, the decision was based on the signed statement of Dean Zantow and the numerous qualifying contributions attached to the old gain two complaint collected by your designated campaign representatives with signatures from voters that inexplicably did not match. The letter on July 6th, 2021, identified additional numerous qualifying contributions, including many from your designated representatives, which again, did not match either their petition signature, their voter registration, or a duplicate qualifying contribution. In addition to declining to certify your campaign, the Office of the City Clerk requested that the Board of Ethics and the City Attorney initiate an investigation into the complaints Olguin 1, Olguin 2, and the July 6, 2021 letter. The chair of the Board of Ethics filed an order directing the parties to respond to the city clerk's request by July 14, 2021. On Wednesday, July 14, 2021, your campaign through council filed a brief regarding the investigation requested by the clerk. And in that brief, your campaign admitted that many of the qualifying contribution receipts identified by the Olguin 2 complaint were signed by someone other than the voter. During a July 15th administrative hearing on your appeal from the, from the determination that you should not be certified, you, through counsel, admitted to a pattern of forgery and state it does indeed appear that some of those QCs were forged. The hearing officer ultimately affirmed the city clerk's decision not to certify you and your campaign to receive public financing. The hearing officer reasoned that failing to detect and eliminate a multitude of forged qualifying contribution forms bearing the signatures of key subordinates constitutes a failure to exercise ordinary care in the management of a campaign and meets the new or should have known standard of part C15A3 of the Open and Ethical Elections Code regulations. On August 16th, 2021, the Office of the Inspector General issued its report regarding the allegations in Olguin 1, Olguin 2, and the letter of July 6th, 2021. The investigation looked at a random sample from within the paper contributions your campaign submitted, contributions gathered on the date of the Salvation Army board meeting, and a sample of the contributions submitted with Olguin 2 and the letter of July 6, 2021. The investigation also afforded you an opportunity to speak with the Office of the Inspector General regarding the matters under review. From the three sample groups it considered, the OIG found the following. Out of a sample of 239, 23 instances where individuals indicated they did not sign the QC receipt and did not pay the $5. 
Michelle Martinez, your designated representative, signed nine of these receipts as the person collecting the contribution. Megan McMillan, your other designated representative, signed four of these receipts as the person collecting the contribution. They also found 15 instances where individuals indicated they signed a QC receipt but did not pay the required $5 contribution. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, you signed four of these receipts as the person collecting the contribution. Michelle Marcinez, your designated representative, signed three of these receipts as the person collecting the contribution. With regard to the other QCs attached to Olgain II and the letter of July 6th, the OIG made contact with 18 of the purported contributors and found eight instances where individuals indicated they did not sign the QC receipt and did not contribute $5, and one instance where an individual signed the QC receipt but did not pay the $5. Michelle Martinez, your designated representative, was the collecting representative on five of these qualifying contributions. Megan McMillan, also your designated representative, was the collective representative on two of the qualifying contributions. With regard to the contributions gathered on May 27, 2021, the day of the Salvation Army Board meeting, the OIG was able to contact five people and found as follows. Two people who did not sign the QC receipt or pay the $5, and two individuals who signed the QC receipt but did not pay the $5. The OIG's investigation identified numerous instances where your designated campaign representatives, Michelle Martinez and Megan Gumelin, signed receipts indicating they had collected $5 from a voter and the voter had signed the receipt when in fact neither was true. These receipts were then submitted to the office of the city clerk. It also identified instances where you gathered qualifying contribution receipts from individuals who did not make the required contributions. In total, there appear to be dozens of instances, excuse me, incidents where qualifying contributions were gathered without the corresponding donation, but the qualifying contribution receipts were subsequently turned into the clerk's office with the correct amount of money to match the number of donations your campaign should have received. While some of these receipts appear to have been gathered by individuals or volunteers, many were gathered by you personally and your campaign representatives. The Office of the City Clerk submitted with this notice of contemplated action additional material it received from the OIG related to its investigation. Again, these incidents do not appear isolated or limited to volunteers, but instead are repeated by you yourself and your campaign's designated representatives. Moreover, as noted above, your weekly submissions of qualifying contributions and cash to the city clerk's office reconciled. It was always your campaign representatives who turned in the QC receipts and the corresponding funds to the city clerk's office. Your campaign has filed five different campaign finance reports with the Office of the City Clerk on the schedule outlined in the charter. Each of these reports was filed by your third designated representative, Dolores Gonzalez Limon, and she swore under penalty of perjury that each of the reports was true and correct to the best of her knowledge. In none of these reports does it report, explain, or suggest the source of the money used to make the qualifying contribution receipts match the funds submitted to the clerk's office. This is especially concerning in the cases of those qualifying contributions that were gathered and or generated by you or your campaign's designated representative. Those are the fourth part of the allegations against uh, you and your campaign and the fourth part of the legal basis for the proposed denial. How do you respond to that portion of the notice? Your response will be part of the record. All right, again, we, we continue to object uh, to this hearing uh, as a sham. At the risk of giving any credence to this meaningless hearing or legitimizing this hearing, I will point out that the city clerk uh, did find that we did not qualify for public financing on July 9th. That was later found by District Court Brian Beachide to be in violation of Sheriff Gonzalez's due process rights. If you could speak into the mic, I, I apologize. I was, I was assured that the, the microphone fix was going to be the fix, but uh, I will, I will uh, repeat myself just to make sure that the record is clear. Uh, we do admit that on July 9th, the city clerk uh, found that uh, Sheriff Gonzalez did not qualify for public financing. District Judge Brian Beachide found that that determination was a violation of Sheriff Gonzalez's due process rights. 
to the extent that there are quotations uh, from the hearing officer in that case, Judge Beachide determined that the subsequent hearing did not cure the initial due process violation. Now, there are uh, a couple quotations uh, from, from counsel in terms of briefing. And it is true that, that the campaign has conceded that some, but certainly not all, of the alleged problematic uh, qualifying contribution sheets appear to have been signed by someone other than the contributor. But the campaign has never conceded how many and has never, not once, conceded that Sheriff Gonzalez knew or should have known of these problematic qualifying contribution sheets. And we've argued to the contrary, that it was reasonable for the sheriff to presume that everything was fine with his QC collection program when he did not hear anything from the city clerk's office regarding any sig signature irregularities, which should have been detected during the clerk's signature verification. That is, the clerk's office is required by the clerk's own regulations to verify each and every QC, including conducting a signature match against voter registration documents. Sheriff Gonzalez was entitled to presume that the clerk's office was complying with its legal obligations. And when the Gonzalez campaign was never notified of any problematic QCs, i.e. QCs that were rejected or left pending for fraud or forgery, the sheriff had no reason to believe that anything untoward was occurring with respect to the campaign's collection of QCs. And in fact, such silence from the city clerk could reasonably have been taken as a positive sign for the campaign and its QC collection program. The rest of the allegations made uh, within the IG's report are based upon untested, unconfronted hearsay. We have a hearing that is set for September 10th that is supposed to be an evidentiary hearing before the Board of Ethics, in which case there will be witness testimony, at least according to the witness list I have seen, and to use uh, these untested, unverified, un, uh, basically unconfronted statements without the opportunity for us to even look these people in the eye to determine any sort of bias or motive uh, is completely unfair. The fact that there's additional information contained within uh, the exhibits for this case, uh, again, I, I think show that the clerk is not an impartial decision maker, that the clerk has essentially gone out, uh, has sought out more information in order to uh, bolster the case against uh, Sheriff Gonzalez uh, in any case, it's my understanding that the Keller campaign has admitted forgery, and yet he has not uh, been placed into this uh, same situation with untested, unverified statements being placed in a big pile in front of him and, and forcing him uh, to explain himself to a biased decision maker. To the extent uh, that uh, there's mention of the designated representatives, I will uh, mention for the record that this idea that a designated representative on a designated representative form can serve as the basis for the new or should have known standard is a creation of the clerk and his attorneys. And the fact that the clerk has essentially created, concocted this legal argument uh, leads me to believe that no matter what I say, sitting here, uh, I am not going to change the clerk's mind on whether or not that form has any legal bearing. Uh, but I will argue uh, in order to preserve the record, not necessarily to persuade, because I don't believe I'm gonna persuade anyone here today, that that is in fact not the case, that that designated form for, re for representatives does not support the basis for a new or should have known determination. Thank you. Mr. Gallegos, just to clarify, does um, Sheriff Gonzalez or the Gonzalez campaign have any further testimony it wishes to um, provide in today's hearing?
No, that is the extent of our presentation here today. Based on the parties on the Gonzales campaign's representation, I am going to conclude this hearing. Thank you for attending. I will make a determination regarding certification within the next 24 hours, so by 10 a.m. on Thursday. And it is now 9.53, and I will ask that we go off the record at exactly 10 a.m. But the parties are excused. We'll stay on the record for the purpose of ensuring that the exhibits all end up in the record. The only exhibit, to my knowledge, is that exhibit one. Um, and there is a, council, a copy at council table which we can put in the, um, put in the record. <laughs>